Uh, my name is Evgenia Gaber. I'm a doctor in political science and foreign policy analyst, uh, currently working for the Atlantic Council and a couple of other think tanks, and until recently, foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister of Ukraine and uh, deputy director of the Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And today, uh, we're going to talk about why wording matters when working with analytics. Uh, why it matters when uh, we are reading uh, texts written by others, ourselves, or when we are listening to the official statements by high rank officials, for example, why, why we are working with the texts of treaties and uh, agreements, bilateral and uh, multilateral um, charters of the international organization sometimes, but also why we have to be very cautious uh, and very precise uh, in uh, wording, in phrasing, and in framing our messages uh, when we're preparing policy papers, policy recommendations, or just writing uh, articles ourselves as experts. So within the next uh, 30 minutes, I will uh, try to guide you through the whole world of uh, linguistics, uh, politics, and international affairs explaining how they intersect and uh, why it's not necessarily about the philology, but rather about being politically correct, geographically correct, historically correct, culturally and linguistically uh, correct, uh, while uh, doing our main job as foreign policy analysts. And I will uh, split my presentation into parts. First, talking about how to work with information that we get from other uh, resources, from uh, media outlets, both uh, conventional and non-conventional. Uh, again, official statements, uh, newspapers, and all other different sources of information. And uh, in the second part, I will talk about how we uh, can and should be more careful in uh, choosing um, synonyms, uh, terms, uh, terminology, and uh, certain phrases, sometimes even articles, sometimes even prepositions when we are writing or drafting our own texts. So to start with, uh, it's really important to understand that language is one of the most important uh, working tools for a foreign policy analyst if we're talking about professionals in this sphere. This is how uh, we get information. This is how we um, collect uh, information and uh, done with the critical thinking, with situational analysis and with our own uh, processing um, of the information, we come to certain conclusions. So even before we get to actually writing any text, we want to have a full picture of what is going on. Uh, we want to answer three main questions which are critical for any situational analysis, and those are what happened, how it happened, and why it happened, most importantly. To answer those questions, obviously, we need to get information from as many different sources as possible. We're living in the uh, period of, uh, in the era, actually, of uh, post-truth, of uh, hybrid warfare. So for that reason, being um, accurate about the information that we're gathering and getting it from uh, different sources is crucial for uh, making any conclusions before we actually jump to conclusions to be sure that we get perspectives from different parties to the conflict, to negotiations, to any political process we're talking about, stakeholders, their interests, and their positions. What is also important for us as foreign policy analysts is not only to read what is being said, written, or spoken, but also to be able to read and hear the unspeakable not only to read the words, but also to read the intentions behind those words or messages. So for us as foreign policy analysts, it's important to be able to see and to read both those messages which are there on paper or voiced by someone and those messages which are not there uh, but probably uh, they should have been there, or they're there, but they are uh, phrased in a very uh, different way. So all those nuances, all those hidden secrets of our profession, very often are uh, about words. 
So the first recommendation for any analyst is, of course, uh, about gathering information is, of course, to learn the language of the country that is or will be the main focus of your intention and which you will be covering as part of your professional portfolio. Very often when we are talking about such countries as, uh, let's say, English speaking, French, German speaking countries, those on the European continent, it may be a bit easier for us because those languages are more uh, popular and widespread. But very often uh, for those analysts who are uh, doing the Middle East, Africa, the Arab countries, uh, East Asia, for example, as part of their day-to-day uh, -day job, it's a real challenge to learn the language of the country that they are covering. But that is something to be done. And why this is important for several reasons. Uh, the first one is the most obvious reason to be able uh, to get first-hand information from uh, original sources. First of all, those are official statements by the uh, country leaders, by presidents, prime ministers, heads of parliament, head, heads of different political parties, opposition, uh, ruling party, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, second, those are, as I have already mentioned, media, uh, both conventional like newspapers or uh, magazines or journals, and also non-conventional like social media, uh, like uh, Twitters and uh, Facebooks and uh, forums and so on. And this is where uh, the knowledge of the local language is really important. Because very often the information that you will get there, reading um, the trending messages in certain um, sectors of Twitter, will provide you with more information than just social polls, which are officially uh, carried out by some companies. First, because it takes time to have those polls. Second, because they are mostly about statistics, they're mostly about the sociology and about those questions that are there. But if you are able to follow all those different uh, layers of information from expert community and academia uh, in this particular country which you are covering to a general debate uh, on the social media regarding certain processes, you will get a much better um, grasp of what is uh, going on in uh, uh, the country and you will have the feeling of the tissue, as we say uh, in our professional jargon, meaning that you will be able to actually feel the pulse of the country or the region or let's say uh, continent maybe in some uh, cases that you are covering. So that is really important. Uh, second, uh, think uh, very often, uh, depending on the um, target audience uh, to which uh, the uh, high top rank officials are um, addressing, uh, you might have a different wording in, in the same messages, in the same official statements, which uh, are published, for example, in, let's say, Turkish language meaning that those will be messages uh, of the president or uh, vice president to, to the Turkish population. And then the same uh, message or quite the same, almost the same message, which goes uh, to Russia, for example, if that is the Russian translation or the Russian version of that statement on the official website. And then you will have the one in English, which goes for the uh, Western partners of Turkey and uh, those messages can be framed in a very different way. So uh, if you wanna uh, you know, fuel up somehow nationalistic or conservative sentiments, uh, sometimes anti-Western sentiments inside your society, you would probably use a more harsh wording, criticizing someone actually making very um, blunt, um, statements about how inefficient the EU's policies are, and then, um, for example, talking to, uh, to, to the Russian target audiences or Russian-speaking target audiences, you might be willing to stress on some uh, Eurasianal intentions and how Turkey and uh, Russia have a lot in common. And then when you have the same uh, statement or almost the same statement of the same events for the Western partners, you would put it in a very different way, being much softer and milder on the EU part and Western part and less uh, 
obvious and the blunt about uh, the um, needs of cooperation with Russia and so on. So uh, if you don't know the language of the country that you are covering, be sure that you uh, at least read a couple of different translations of the same text in the languages uh, that uh, you are feeling comfortable with. That will give you also uh, first the complete picture of what is going on and then a general understanding of how those messages are framed for different target audiences, which is also important for us in terms of analyzing the um, strategic communication and, as I say, the unspeakable intentions behind those messages. But it's also about the accuracy of the text you're dealing with. Sometimes you might have some technical mistakes in translation or interpretation. And this is uh, unfortunately a human factor, which is always there. You never know who is translating, whether it's been checked or not. Very often being interpreted myself, I know that many of those texts, for example, they are just um, translated somewhere uh, during the nighttime in the middle of, uh, I don't know, some halls succession halls and corridors of the United Nations, let's say, of course, they're all checked, but sometimes, uh, and we have a lot of examples of that, the wording which is used, or some particular numbers, or some even factual mistakes might happen uh, just because what you have in the original text does not necessarily make it to the uh, translated version of the text. So trust your intuition. Uh, check different sources. Check different uh, versions of the same text. And if you feel that there is something wrong there, if what you are reading does not really fit the picture uh, that you have in your mind, trust your intuition, trust your expertise and double check, cross check everything that um, you are seeing because very often it's about some accents or some uh, word play uh, in the original quotes which might not uh, be reflected in the translated uh, texts. Uh, afterwards. So in case there are some kind of sensational quotations or citations by someone before you actually quote someone, uh, take time to, to double check and to be sure that this is really uh, what you are uh, reading and this is really what has been said. Second uh, thing uh, is um, about the war of narratives. So it's not only about um, checking the information itself, disinformation, fake news, and so on. Uh, it is also about how we frame the discourse, how we shape the public opinion, how we shape the debates and discussions in academia, in expert community. And uh, depending on that, many structuralists would say that First, you imagine something, then you say this exists, and then it actually comes into being. Even if you are not a, a constructivist and you are a kind of political realist like I am, by the way, or uh, adapt uh, any other um, uh, school of international uh, relations, uh, it's important to understand that especially now, uh, the war is going on not only uh, on the battlefield with the military equipment and personnel, but also if this is a, the war for hearts and minds of different people, and this is the war of narratives, and this is again a war of words. So for example, and I will just give you a couple of examples uh, how it generally works, um, by using, uh, again, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, a wrong or politically incorrect uh, term for a certain organization which is recognized or not recognized in certain countries, terror organizations, certain territories with, with a disputed status there, be careful. Uh, how uh, you choose those words, uh, whether you really want to use this particular term, which is loaded, uh, not only linguistically, but also with political, geopolitical, uh, sometimes economic, sometimes philosophical, sometimes religious, sometimes uh, historical um, sense and connotation. Or uh, have you just uh, used this or that word because that was the first uh, synonym which is not often synonym, but rather the first random word which comes to your mind. Uh, let me explain you. For example, um, very often when uh, we're talking about the 
situation in Ukraine, right? Uh, someone uh, would choose a term Donbas uh, for the uh, eastern parts of Ukraine. And that's, by the way, very often used by Ukrainians uh, themselves, Ukrainian expert themselves. But then it might lead you to uh, to the same usage of a term uh, people of Donbass uh, or um, population of Donbass, for example, who are under shelling or something like this. Um, this uh, brings us completely into the Russian narrative saying that Donbass is a separate political entity of Ukraine, uh, that uh, there is the so-called people of Donbass, which is uh, different from the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian nation, and so on and so forth. And that, that will lead you as far as to all those talks about separatists uh, living in the east of Ukraine and speaking the uh, Russian language and being very different in their national identity from Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians, not only in terms of political nation, but also ethnic nation, and so on and so forth. Whereas uh, the right uh, way, or rather more correct way of uh, uh, addressing the, uh, the area would be either using uh, the administrative uh, structure of Ukraine, talking about the Lugansk and the Donetsk uh, regions uh, of Ukraine, and uh, that will be the, the easiest way to do that. Or um, if you want to address to those territories, especially uh, in between 2014 and uh, 2022, uh, those areas which uh, had been under the Russian occupation before a um, new wave of invasion in 2022 in February, then you would probably like to talk about separate or certain um, uh, areas uh, of the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions, which is the so-called Ordlo, the temporarily occupied uh, territories of Ukraine. The same goes, for example, with Crimea. Very often you would uh, see the usage of term uh, annexation of Crimea or annex Crimea, which is again uh, quite a tricky question because whereas you are talking about the annexed uh, Crimea, meaning this is uh, fait accompli, this is de facto something that happened and you're kind of recognizing the um, annexation of Crimea, something that has uh, happened. Uh, of course, we do not recognize the uh, annexation of Crimea, so you would either use um, attempted annexation of Crimea or illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea or temporarily occupied Crimea to show that there is no change in the status of Crimea, but this is rather the situation on the ground. Politically, nothing has actually changed for any of the uh, European countries or uh, Ukraine or its partners. So if you check, and that's something uh, quite interesting to do as an exercise, if you check statements by uh, by the US State Department, for example, and then the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then some other countries in Europe and in Asia on how they actually call the um, illegal annexation of Crimea, right? Or the so-called uh, LNR DNR, so-called People's Republic there. It's very telling, and you can uh, tell a lot about the political uh, position on, on the issue by the leadership of those countries. Again, uh, depending on uh, whether you are speaking, whether you are writing, you might want to use the quotation marks, of course. You might want to use the word so-called uh, Lugansk or Donetsk People's Republic, or sometimes you would actually say these are terror organizations, these are quasi-organizations there, and so on and so forth. So uh, talking about all those things, you want to be sure that you are using the right um, version, not necessarily uh, in tending to uh, quote the uh, Russian narratives, but sometimes just being uh, trapped into this general uh, chaos of different narratives and terms which are used. Especially when it comes to the occupied territories, not only in Ukraine, but also in other countries, it's important to pay attention to how, for example, you call the line between the government controlled areas and the occupied or temporarily occupied territories of those countries. So, for example, when we're talking about Georgia, you would very rarely, almost never, uh, hear the Georgian officials using uh, the term line of contact or um, border between uh, Russian uh, forces and Georgia. 
what you will hear would be the uh, occupational line uh, because they want to um, underline this is occupation or uh, sometimes the line of contact is used because this is the terminology used by the OC uh, by the United Nations and by the um, international uh, organizations very often because this is kind of the most unbiased, very neutral term to use. But again, uh, if uh, you are talking about a border, for example, between Crimea and Ukraine or between Tsin Valley region in Georgia and the rest of Georgia, the Tsin Valley region, which is now under occupation, um, then you would probably... Uh, make a mistake using the word border because border is something which is only um, attributed to the can be attributed to the state border uh, underlining that uh, the sovereignty of one country is uh, measured or limited with the state borders of the other country so in case we're talking about occupied territories you cannot use the word border because it actually would mean that uh, you're kind of given up of, on the territories which are behind this line, which is uh, labeled or named as a border. Administrative line would be the case for um, naming or talking about the line between the Kherson region of Ukraine and um, Crimea, especially again uh, before the February 2022. Obviously, Kherson region is now also. Um, under the occupation, but the uh, the terminology uh, to be used is uh, really important. Be sure that you know which terminology is used in different foreign languages. If you are working again with uh, some specific countries, which might be using the kind of exotic languages there. Um, with Tsin Valley region, it's also interesting because the Georgians would uh, rather use Tsin Valley, uh, having this authentic name for the region rather than um, Ossetia, South Ossetia, which is used by Russians again. Because when you talk about the South Ossetia, you would most probably uh, keep in mind that there is also North Ossetia, which is inside the Russian Federation. And thus, there is this Ossetia, which is... Uh, partitioned or divided between the two countries and might want to reunite uh, in a way. So every time for each particular region, you want to check, you might want to check the um, authentic name, um, which also reflects the official position of this particular country, and then choose whether you want to follow the same line or whether you would actually prefer to, to use your own word in which will show your political uh, preferences or your uh, stance on the issue. For this reason, uh, it's not only about the names of certain regions, it's also about the names of certain countries which have been changed, uh, showing the shift in uh, perceptions, uh, self-perceptions of those countries and the shift of uh, uh, sometimes uh, strategic thinking, sometimes uh, geopolitical uh, developments on the ground. But very often, this is something we, we may not pay attention to, but that is really important. To give you uh, a couple of examples here, just recently, uh, Turkey, and uh, I'm still using for the purpose of this video, its old name, Turkey, has been renamed into Turkey. Uh, following the uh, request of the Turkish government to the United Nations, and that was officially recognized by the United Nations. So now this is also a very sensitive issue. If you use uh, the old word Turkey in your text, that will probably show your uh, position either viewing Turkey from a very European-centric, uh, Western-centric uh, point of view, because this is how Turkey is called and has been called in the West for many years. Or if you use Turkey, you would rather stick to uh, Turkey's uh, current uh, position and Turkey's uh, current self-perception viewing itself uh, as a regional power, emerging uh, power which wants to, uh, to explore its history, to get back to its roots, 
And the name Turkey, uh, which is closely associated with the name of the bird Turkey, which is very often served for, uh, for Thanksgiving or for Christmas in the Orthodox and the Christian countries, is not something that uh, Turkey itself would like it to be called. So after all those several uh, agreements and the uh, Lausanne uh, treaties after the First World War, when Turkey started to be called as Turkey after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, that was okay. But now uh, with the uh, kind of uh, reinvention of Turkey's own um, ambitions or power as a regional, uh, important regional center, what they want to be is to show, to do, it's uh, actually to show that they have their own uh, very distinct culture, very distinct um um, let's say, um, cultural heritage, uh, historical heritage, and they do not want to be called the way their Western partners now, but previously occupying forces uh, during the early years of the 20th uh, century used to call them. This is a very small example, but this tells you a lot of how those things work. And the same goes, for example, for this very famous campaign, which is Kyiv, not Kyiv, meaning that you do not uh, want in Ukraine, one would not uh, want to see Kyiv written in Russian language as a transliteration, um, sorry, Kyiv written in uh, English language as a transliteration from the Russian language with K-I-E-V, but rather uh, sticking to the Kyiv as uh, K-Y-I-V for the Ukrainian original version of the name. Depending on such small things, whether you use, again, uh, article the, the Ukraine, in the Ukraine, or just Ukraine, uh, many people would also judge not only your linguistical or philological capabilities, but also your political views. Do you see Ukraine as a sovereign state? So you would rather use in Ukraine without article, or you will say in the Ukraine, uh, as uh, Ukrainian territory somewhere there. Uh, in Russian language, again, that would be uh, something like uh, on Ukraine, uh, now Ukraine, uh, for those of you who speak Russian, meaning that there is no sovereign state uh, and all those nice stories and propaganda and um, campaigns, uh, operations of influence, which are very much promoted by, uh, by Putin and his current government. So be sure that you use the uh, the right article. Uh, again, uh, important point uh, to make is uh, how you analyze the written texts uh, by the, uh, let's say, treaties, right, or um, agreements or some texts written by the uh, foreign leaders. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the article that has been used, it's not only, again, only about philology, it's also about the um, scope of the territories to be liberated after the war, for example, as it happened in 1967. So if you check the resolution of the United Nations, uh, number 242, which is the resolution which had to stop the uh, Six Days War between the um, Palestine and Israel, you would see a very nice phrase there, which says that the United Nations calls um, on Israel to withdraw its forces from occupied territories. And there is no article there whatsoever from the occupied territories or just from occupied territories. So because of this small article, there are still debates among lawyers and about interna uh, among uh, international law experts and among political scientists on which scope of the uh, occupied territories Israel should withdraw or should have withdrawn its forces from. Um, are we talking only about the um, certain areas which are to be discussed, or are we talking about the whole territories of the uh, Golan Heights and the uh, West Bank and Gaza and, and so on and so forth, which were occupied back then? So the absence of this article leaves this ambiguity about the scope of the territories, just any occupied territories to be uh, probably decided by Israel uh, themselves, you know, from which territories to withdraw. That's interesting. And the same example is also another interesting example of how the uh, Budapest memorandum was uh, discussed and how Ukraine was given up on its own nuclear uh, weapons uh, back in uh, early 1990s, 1992. 
And there was huge discussion on which article to use uh, with the nuclear weapons that Ukraine had to, uh, to abandon. The one version would be uh, the nuclear weapon, meaning that nuclear weapons uh, that uh, belong to Ukraine. The other version would be uh, nuclear weapons, uh, again, uh, without specifying the origin of those weapons. And Russia would insist, and the Russian delegation would insist, and there are all those evidences there, and memoirs, and very nice uh, books written on how uh, Russian delegation would insist on uh, not using a definite article, saying that these nuclear weapons, they are not Ukrainian. They do not belong to Ukraine. They are just uh, were situated and let's say located in Ukraine, but they still uh, belong to the Soviet Union. So sometimes, and uh, many foreign ministers who were present there, they discussed this issue. A very uh, clear linguistic case becomes uh, a very politically loaded and very um, politically sensitive issue uh, when you are dealing with uh, such things as occupation of uh, territories of the other country or nuclear weapons and non-proliferation or uh, anything. Finally, uh, talking about the uh, writing of the text yourselves, and uh, that is where I want to uh, finish my uh, short presentation today with a couple of uh, very precise and um, uh, concrete uh, recommendations before you um, start writing your text. First of all, uh, again, uh, be sure that the uh, information uh, that uh, you have collected is uh, true, correct, precise, accurate information gathered from different sources, including from different sources in uh, different languages, if this is the case. Second, uh, check the official uh, terminology and uh, names of uh, regions, territories, countries, political parties, um, sometimes uh, NGOs, uh, sometimes uh, quasi organizations, uh, military, paramilitary groups, terror organizations how they are named and which names are used in this country by the government and then by the rival parties, and then by the uh, international organizations. For you, that will tell a lot. Who sees some uh, foreign fighters or fighters as terrorists? Uh, which parties see them as probably freedom fighters? Um, and then stick to your own version, knowing the consequences but do it intentionally. And the best version, the best option to do it in a correct and proper way is to use the terminology, which is used again by the uh, United Nations, for example, OCE, international organizations, or um, by the, um, uh, by the uh, country uh, itself, by the official government. Um, if you are talking about uh, several uh, issues which are uh, related to the um, European Union, for example, or uh, NATO, or uh, some specific international organizations, check the vocabulary which is used inside these organizations. Each of those organizations, be it international uh, criminal courts, be it the European Union and all affiliated structures there, United Nations and its agencies, they all have their special, very specific, very precise language. Uh, sometimes it gets very technical, sometimes it gets uh, very uh, narrow, sometimes it gets uh, really very, very uh, specific and arcane, but uh, be sure that you follow the vocabulary that is used in this organization if you're talking about some internal processes or decisions or the names of the committees, commissions, and so on and so forth. Don't try to make up your own names for that. And don't try to interpret or translate yourselves, because very often there will be those great uh, chasms beneath words 
uh, between two or uh, sometimes even more languages and uh, they can be opened without any warning for you and you might not even be aware of uh, choosing the word which is uh, either wrong or politically incorrect or misleading because taking such words even as capacities and capabilities for, for the military people uh, they will mean uh, something very different uh, rather than they would mean for for the civilians or for nato this will be a very different story than for the european union and so on so be sure that you check uh, the names and you check the spelling because again if you're talking about ministry of defense uh, in the UK or uh, in the US, then you will even have different uh, spelling of defense with C or S, which also uh, matters. And the same goes for many other uh, words and agencies and names of institutions. Uh, one more important thing, if you are writing texts which have uh, some technical uh, details inside or which are dealing with very particular issues. These can be uh, texts about COVID-19, these might be texts about biological weapons, about nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, um, about uh, environmental issues uh, and uh, cultural heritage and something else be sure that you consult um, an expert, that you consult a subject matter expert, not only on what you are writing, but also how you are writing and which words you are using. Uh, technical terminology, military terminology, everything which is connected to those engineering sciences and so on and so forth, they are very precise by nature, by default, so you cannot use, if you want to be professional, if you want to sound professional, you cannot use any uh, synonym, any word that you would rather use in your day-to-day -day life if you want to um, uh, have a solid piece with very particular and concrete policy recommendations. Sometimes different types of uh, weapons, different types of uh, vaccines, different types of nuclear reactors uh, would be named with very different names. So depending on which of them you're using, you can actually, again, be either a professional and uh, precise or misleading and confusing your reader with what you actually um, wanted to say there. Uh, last point, which is uh, also important here, and that is the uh, kind of uh, wrap up and uh, summary to this presentation is Reread what you have written. Check that uh, even if you don't have, uh, or if you have uh, a native speaker for a proofreading, be sure again that uh, those words that might have different connotations or those names which are uh, politically sensitive, culturally or religiously sensitive, that you they are used in a proper way at the proper uh, time and in the proper places. And that is the main um, secret to, to your professional success that will uh, not let you write a lot, that will not you let write quickly because that demands additional time and efforts. But in case you have written something, uh, you will be sure that you have done it professionally and uh, you have done actually a profound and uh, a very uh, high quality job, which is uh, the most important thing in, uh, in our profession. Uh, I wish you best of luck uh, and success in your professional endeavors and hope that now uh, you will be more cautious about the words that you are using or not using in your analytical texts.